Welcome back to the Michael Volpe Investigates podcast that I call The Impromptu. I got another great guest. I am here with Yvette Dobby. Yvette, you want to say hello? Hello. Okay. And you, it was actually your your husband and his family that were victimized for a good, like approximately two decades, I think, by the Orange County probate court system. Is that a fair oh. assessment? Very fair. That is correct. Okay. So we'll get through the whole story, but before we do that, you, uh, your, your story has a few figures that, that we've, uh, learned about before. Um, and, uh, the first one I want to talk about is, um, Cicerone is her last name. What's her first name? Sally Cicerone. Okay. And so let me, for people who don't know, she was, uh, the subject of like a disciplinary investigation. And I think it was either 2020 or 2021, the Orange County Register, uh, they, they wrote about her and I think they, they, what they removed her from, from most of the cases she was on at the time, but you had her or your, your husband's case had her probably more than a decade before this, right? When did she first come on the case? She first came on to the case in 2008. And, and how, she, how did I, she, I'm sorry. how did she, what, like, what was she appointed or was she appointed and how did she come on the case? What was she supposed to do? She, well, she's a professional fiduciary. Mm -hmm. and, and recognized by the Orange County Courts. And Teresa Gorman, the attorney at the time, brought her in uh, to serve as the conservator, um, trustee, executor of one of the estates. Okay. And so we'll talk more about her, as I said. But um, describe, like, how she was in your interactions with her. And then also, like, I, I know you you told me that she's very corrupt. Like, a few of the most outrageous things that you can think she did or said. So what, what, what was she like to deal with? Well, the dealings with her were far and few because Teresa Gorman uh, was the attorney at the time and acted as her attorney mm -hmm. and pre pretty much shielded conversations um, between ourselves and her and, and acted as a buffer um, and some of the most egregious things that she did mm -hmm. against us was um, she refused to provide accounting mm -hmm. for monies that she was taking out of the estate. Mm -hmm. um, she did not want to provide any accounting. She was very, very hostile. Um, in the few phone calls that we were able to establish with her. Um, and you know, th these monies were thousands and thousands of dollars at a time and there was no accountability for it. And, and you know, we weren't happy with the whole entire matter as it unfolded and she became involved in the case. And when we saw monies uh, being depleted from accounts, you know, being sanctioned by the court, um, you know, we, we became, of course, very upset and were trying to stop the bleeding, so to speak. So, you know, the big thing for us was there was a, a, a huge amount of money on the table. And once she became involved, those monies were being depleted um, and there was no accounting and line items as to why and what those items were. Okay. And actually, I probably should have started with her, but you've referred to Teresa Gorman a few times. And in fact, when I interviewed um, Jody Sussman, who uh, she was vict victimized by Gorman as well. And uh, Jody had written a couple of things and she, uh, she calls jo she calls Gorman and her husband, Ruben Martinez, the quote unquote head of the snake their company, Fiduciary Real Estate Services, allegedly sells the properties of the victims after, quote unquote, managing and devaluing them. They allegedly sell to their cronies who flip shortly after at great profit. And uh, 
and in fact, that's what happened in your case. But before we get to that, what what was Gorman like, and a few of the most outrageous things that you remember her doing? Well, you know, we don't have all day. Um, <laughs> all right. I, in a couple I, minutes. Okay. Well, Gorman came into the picture because of she was re- referred by an elderly relative who felt that. Uh, one of Steve's siblings needed help. And once she became involved and once she had standing, mm-hmm. it, it game over. It was, she knew there was a lot of money here and that's why she, her tentacles reached far into into this estate and the, in the multiple estates that we had. And she was the ringleader for the theft of monies from our estates. And she did that with the help of Sally Cicerone, who we spoke of earlier, and her husband, Ruben Martinez, who's a real estate agent. Mm-hmm. And we had two properties in this estate. And, uh, you know, one was the home valued at $750,000. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of on the low side. And it was sold for under 500000 a fire sale mm-hmm. by Ruben Martinez. Right um, now, so it sounds like uh, when when in uh, what what Jody described, their company, Fiduciary Real Estate Services, allegedly sells the properties of the victims after quote unquote managing and devaluing them. They allegedly allegedly sell to their cronies who flip shortly after at great profit. It sounds like that basically you were your your husband and his family was victimized by this scheme. Correct. Correct. Right. right. And not, not with regards to the real estate, it didn't happen once, but it happened two times. Correct. Because there were two properties involved. And again, with that second property, the same thing happened. Mm-hmm. And what was even more stunning was the homes were sold without notice to anybody, including my husband. Mm-hmm. So we find out afterwards that these homes were fire sale by Ruben Martinez at a mm-hmm. very low price. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, there was nothing we could do. The, the sale had already occurred. And they do this, they're very good. They do it quickly. Mm-hmm. And they have people lined up to purchase these properties. As you mentioned, they're cronies and friends. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, as you peel back the layers, who knows what the kickbacks were. Obviously, there's commissions involved. And, you know, their, their skin in the game was just getting a hold of these properties and selling them. Okay. And then fiduciary real estate services, it gets a little bit complicated. So for the layman, what is this company and, and, and what is the the role of that, that company in this well, scheme? It, it, I would like to say it's a shell company established and owned by Teresa Gorman, the attorney, and her husband, Ruben Martinez, mm-hmm. and, and that company is to pick up and manage and devalue and sell properties. Okay, so they they use that company as like the home base for all of these transactions. And before we go on, reached out to both Ruben and to Teresa, and uh, neither of them got back to me. I, I don't have a place to reach out to Sally Cicero. That might be my my fault. So uh, let, uh, I got one more question, and then we'll get to the beginning. I, have you seen the movie I Care A Lot? Does that sound familiar? It, it does sound familiar. It's it's wonderful. It's heartbreaking. Because uh, the, the schemes you're describing, they're, they're like I Care A Lot like. Now, basically, there, there's a technical difference in your case. In a, in a sense, it's a distinction without a difference. No one, uh, none of the victims were placed in the guardianship. This was a trustee matter, which is a slightly different way, uh, slightly different than conservatorship. But it sounds like the scheme was pretty similar besides that, right? Right, right. And and the scheme is exactly the same, except in our case, people had passed away Mm -hmm. and estates kept evolving into other estates. And once Teresa Gorman had standing, Mm -hmm. the the common thread here, whether it's a conservatorship or a a trustee or an executor, is money. Right. Their end end game is 
to get the money as much as possible mm-hmm. um, out of the hands of the people who are rightfully entitled to it okay. and to themselves. They are creating chaos and working the system and putting money in their pockets. Okay. So uh, I think this all started like early 2000s. So walk me in, in the audience in like five to 10 minutes or so from the beginning of the story until Gorman is appointed? Well, in 2001, Steve's father passed away. Steve is, your, Steve is your husband. Steve is your husband. Steve is my husband. Timothy was his father. And, and he left a very, very rich estate of about $10 million, going the majority to his children, which was my husband, Steve, and his two siblings. And in 2002, my husband was appointed trustee of that estate, and it was supported by, you know, his siblings and himself, of course. Mm -hmm. And then in 2005, one of my husband's siblings passed away. Mm -hmm. So he left a sizable estate, you know, including a a home and a vehicle and other personal effects. And those went to Steve and his remaining sibling, Patricia. Mm -hmm. So Steve then became the executor of trustee of that estate in which he managed for three years and and everything was going well. Well, in 2008, Steve's other sibling, uh, Patricia, became ill with a, a rare disease. And during her illness then, it was suggested that she get her affairs in order. So Patricia, the, the sibling who's ill, hired Gorman to draft a Now, before and- you go on... How did she find Gorman? Well, Gorman came into the picture because Patricia, Steve and Patricia's mother, uh, Janet, had seen an ad in a local Leisure World paper where Gorman advertised her services. Now, Gorman's ad is significant because Steve's mother, their, their mother, is elderly, and she lives in this community, for those who aren't aware, it's called Leisure World in Laguna Woods, California, and it's it's an elderly community, and so these people are older people. And Gorman's ad is placed very strategically in in these papers around the Leisure World community, which included Steve's mother. And she she doesn't know she sees his name and she suggests to her daughter, "Hey, you you know you need a nice attorney to come in and create you know your documents." So your trust and, and, and all of your property and, and money goes to whom you want it to go to. So it doesn't go into probate. And that's how Gorman became involved initially. Right. So she, she was actually hired because she uh, advertised her services to a target market where Correct. she in effect could troll for victims. Correct. It's, okay. it, that's exactly it. She, what a perfect scheme for, for, for her. Okay, to so people who are not otherwise aware. Okay, so you you gave the audience an idea of some of the stuff Gorman did, but get more specific. So what happens after Gorman gets involved, and then how does Cicerone get involved, and how does everything go sideways? Well, it it, it, it went sideways initially with Gorman and and Steve's sister, who was still alive at the time. Because Gorman drafted documents, pretty much placing her as, as the controller of everything. And Patricia, the sister who was sick, was very uncomfortable with this and was trying desperately to get a hold of Gorman, who would not return her calls. And then Gorman claimed to be out of the country and all the documents were, that Patricia had signed were going to stand. Well, her Patricia's health was rapidly deteriorating. And because Gorman could not make herself available and nothing could be done, two weeks later, Patricia dies. Mm-hmm. And this this is now the beginning of, of Gorman's involvement and then Cicerone's involvement. Um, Gorman did not want Steve in the picture because he was standing in the way of Gorman and Cicerone having full control. So... After Patricia passed, Gorman immediately went into the court and asked for Cicerone to be a t- appointed successor trustee, removing Steve entirely. 
Now, we're talking about Patricia's estate as well as Scott Dobby's estate, the gentleman I talked about who passed away in 2005, Steve Sibling. So there was two estates in play here. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the court, of course, said sure and gave Borman the blessing and allowed Cicerone to come in and help control the money. Once they had standing and once they had their foot in the door, it was over. So Gorman made moves on friends of Patricia's who she had gifted uh, money to, to some friends. Um, and Gorman made friends with these friends and told them, listen, you know, I need you to go along with me because Steve's got to get out of the picture. And you'll get your money if you play along. So she kind of worked the, the list of people to put them in her pocket so she could have control of them and the money. And so that's when the home of Patricia was sold. Martinez had the listing and sold that house within two weeks. And our attorneys are, you know, in court every week and they're trying in vain to say, you know, why have you given control to Cicerone and Gorman and Steve is more than capable of handling his family's affairs. But pretty much the court turned a blind eye and I think, you know, they hear this all day long and Gorman was an expert at working the system. Mm -hmm. And so then it became apparent to us that after you know we asked for accounting and proceeds from the home you know which were benefiting Gorman and solely, Cicero solely because they controlled the bank accounts they were controlling disbursements none of that money was being dispersed to the to Steve or to the other people who like in Patricia's case had left money to yet um so by keeping Steve away from the accounting and the big picture, just this was just a piggy bank for Gorman and Cicero. And, and and I think you mentioned that they never provided an accounting of what was happening. Never provided accounting. Okay. Never ever provided accounting to us or to the court. And and by the end, most if not all of the estate, which was originally valued at ten million, was completely gone. Right. Gone. Right. right. Well, and you have no idea what happened. Well, during all these years, Barman and Cicero are, are in control of funds. Mm -hmm. My husband, Steve, did not want to give up. And so we had to pay the attorneys out of our pocket, our attorneys out of our pocket. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, we just, there was so, at that time, so much money on the table. We thought, well, we could win that. You mm -hmm. know, this is, this is wrong. And usually good prevails over evil. Mm -hmm. But, um, after a while, you know, we we sunk in our personal money, and you know, over seven hundred and eighty thousand dollars of our own money mm -hmm. to pay for lawyers. We, you know, and that the battle over monies and Gorman and Cicerone's involvement continued for several years, which it concluded in twenty seventeen. Mm -hmm. The end result was well over a million in attorney's fees and Gorman, Cicerone, and Martinez collectively, and we're, we're being generous here, over $1.2 million in fees and distributions to themselves. So they drained all the money. And, and then they also sold the two properties. So uh, now walk through the audience through that. How did they sell the two properties? How are they allowed to do this? Well, once Gor Gorman gave Cicerone standing to come in, they had every right because they were overseeing the two estates mm -hmm. to sell the properties, which they did very quickly. Mm -hmm. And so those two properties were sold within two weeks mm -hmm. and those monies went into the big bank account, which were controlled by Gorman mm -hmm. and Cicerone. And we never saw any of that, and nor did we ever get an accounting. But neighbors told us, oh, yeah, you know, they were fire sales. And, you know, you look online because it's public information, and you see that 
they were sold for well, you know, under value. Mm-hmm. And Martinez, who is Teresa Gorman's husband, was the broker of record. Right. And this so, is a, uh, and this again is qu- quite a common scheme that Gorman comes in, sells property under value, and uses her husband as the broker of record. Correct. Right. And, and, and she'll bring in someone like Sally Cicerone to, you know, go ahead and, you know, start charging them for things they didn't want, order, or know, or know about, and make distributions to themselves. That's why Sally Cicerone is no longer a fiduciary. Her license was pulled, I believe it was in 2021, and she was forced to retire and give up the cases she was working on because she was accused of theft. Right. Now, the, the, there's no, been no criminal charges against her, mm-hmm. though there, there should be, and I don't understand why there hasn't been, um, but she's not practicing anymore. So no doubt, Gorman is still out there operating. Mm-hmm. With her husband, but they probably have some other uh, tr- trustee other than Cicerone acting on on their behalf, and and it continues, and there will be more victims until this is stopped. Okay, um, and so how did the? I think it it eventually. How did it all end? Well, it ended with a whimper. I tell you because. At the end, in 2017, it was $1,400 that Steve had asked for uh, Gorman to pay. He found that there was that little bit of an amount in in an account, and she said no. And God bless Steve. He went to court, and he filed in pro per, and the court ruled in his favor. And uh, he went to her office and picked up that final check okay after all of that and that was the end of it so a 10 million dollar estate and all of it except fourteen hundred dollars disappears gone and no one can tell you where it went Uh, no one will tell us where it went no one will tell you where it went and you've you you've gone to like law enforcement with this or no we have not. Okay. We were told that that would be a tough case to prosecute because they were operating within the letter of the law, and the court pretty much blessed their behavior and what they were doing. And mm-hmm. um, you know, there was no criminal action because they were legally entitled to take the money. Uh, because the court turned a blind eye. Right. That's what they'll tell you. I think they said and, the same thing about April Parks until she was prosecuted. And well, others and, those, and, oh, go ahead. You know, I look forward to that day. And I guess, you know, what I would tell anyone is be careful who you give standing to mm-hmm. when you're setting up your estate or your trust or mm-hmm. your wills. Mm-hmm. Because this if this can happen to us, it can happen to anyone, and it has happened to many people. And I've been contacted by victims, and we've shared stories. Um, I wish there was something more that could be done, and I appreciate what you're doing, and you're exposing them for what they are, and, and mm-hmm. perhaps this will stop mm-hmm. um, when someone realizes that, you know, this is, they're, they're thieves. Right. They're thieves. Have you thought of any laws that could be changed or enacted that would help stop something like this? Oh, my goodness. It would be wonderful to have, you know, a, a conservatorship law, you know, in, in someone's name that, the courts will recognize that the the local prosecutors will recognize. So when there's malfeasance like this, uh, it, it, it stops, and the people doing it, such as Gorman and Cicerone, are are taken to jail. And right. they they should be in prison for what they do. They ruin lives. They mm-hmm. create chaos within families. They work the system, which is inherently broken, 
and there's no checks and balances. So it's a license for them to steal. And they're not the only attorneys and conservators that are doing this. This is happening all over the country. Ours is just one of thousands of stories. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's, it's just, it's criminal. Right. And, and so everyone is clear one of the reasons why you say this is happening all over the country is because you've actually talked to people all over the country yeah. victimized, right? They, they, they find our name in the court docket and they see all the cases. I mean, our, our attorneys had half of a floor full of file boxes because mm -hmm. our case had been going on for 15 years and they had to keep, you know, records of our case and, um, so people would find us and call and, you know, what can we do? And um, it's just heartbreaking because, you know, there's not much we can offer mm -hmm. other than advice and lessons learned. And, you mm -hmm. know, be careful who you hire and be careful who you bring into the fold. And again, it goes back to when someone has standing. The Gorman came in and she gave sister on standing and that, that was the beginning of the end. Right. For us. Right. It's so easy to create that kind of standing. Okay. Last like couple of minutes. Anything else you wanted to add? Any any other outrageous things that Gorman or Cicerone did or, or anybody else that you remember you want to make sure you share with the audience? I you know, there was just so much theft of money and it was it was an ongoing occurrence and when you know i think the one thing i do want to mention before we close is when we became aware of this and we brought it up our attorneys were good i mean they were as good as they could be but they they, they were dealing with professionals here gorman was in court every week you know mm -hmm. and she would be making filings well when you make a filing in court it needs to be answered so she kept our guys very busy with needless filings and it was all by design with smoke and mirrors and so that we we were at a disadvantage because of that but it also the disadvantage was the court system mm -hmm. they didn't they didn't help us at all they mm -hmm. didn't see what was happening um probably and, didn't want to see they probably didn't want to see no and they're overwhelmed and Right. That, that's a part of it. But I, I think they know what's going on. They they just turn a blind eye. They turn a blind eye. And mm -hmm. it, it costs a lot of money and a lot of, you know, Heartache. we're most emotionally spent, physically spent. Mm -hmm. um, and every time my phone rings and I get a call from a victim, I just, you know, it, we relive it all over again. And I just say to myself, when is this going to stop? Right. Hopefully soon. All right. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Mike.